Another science fiction phenomenon that was big on using portals was the very popular Stargate television franchise. Stargate was initially conceived by Roland Emmerich and Dean Devlin and released as a Hollywood motion picture in October 1994. The plot centers on the premise of a Stargate, an ancient ring-shaped device that creates a wormhole, enabling travel to a similar device elsewhere in the universe. The film's central plot explores the theory of extraterrestrial beings having an influence upon human civilization. In 1996, MGM hired Brad Wright and Jonathan Glasner to create a spin-off television series. Stargate SG-1 first aired in July 1997 and ran for 10 years. Further spin-offs included an animated television series, Stargate Infinity 2002-2003, and two live-action serials, Stargate Atlantis 2004-2009, and Stargate Universe 2009-2011. Two direct-to-DVD movies were also produced, entitled The Arc of Truth and Continuum. The Stargate franchise included extensive narrative nods to ancient civilizations, particularly during the Egyptian era, the idea that ancient alien contact created the basis of numerous mythologies and religions, Egyptian gods, Norse deities, even the Arthurian legends, etc., the idea that lost cities and outposts of humanity, such as the fabled Atlantis, were actually extraterrestrial bases and colonies, the list goes on. The franchise was also very much an establishment favorite, publicly endorsed by NASA, U.S. Space Command, and the U.S. Department of Defense, the USAF in particular. Originally the Air Force just wanted to review the scripts to Stargate SG-1, but the producers decided to ask for advisors to avoid artistic license military and actually listen to them, though a few errors still got through, Samantha's hair getting too long, Jen. Landry having his hands in his pockets, etc. Before long, the show was using real Air Force personnel, playing many of its extras, and two chiefs of staff, appearing as themselves. Generals Michael E. Ryan and John P. Jumper. In a testament to how much the military likes the Stargate-verse, the real-life Nord has a door inside the building, labeled Stargate Command, it's a broom closet. And Richard Dean Anderson was named an honorary Air Force Brigadier General for his role as Jack O'Neill. In Stargate Continuum, the Navy let them film the outside and inside of a real nuclear attack submarine in the Arctic, doing a number of through the ice pack surfaces for it. Not to be outdone, the Air Force let them film inside real F-15s. Before I continue the video, please give a like if you've learned something. And, don't forget to subscribe, and also, click the notification bell too, so you won't miss any update. And, watch to the end, to avoid misunderstanding. Thank you. The Theosophical Root Races of Human Evolution featured heavily as a story concept in Stargate SG-1, particularly the notion of the contemporary fifth race. The television series featured an ancient high council of supreme beings. This alliance is sought out by the human protagonists, who eventually encounter the alien Grey or Asgard race, one such member race of this council. In an episode, actually called, The Fifth Race, the Asgard welcomed humanity with the words, you have taken the first steps toward becoming the fifth race. The Root Race's concept also influenced the narrative of the coming race, or Vril, the power of the coming race, originally published anonymously in late 1871. The story depicted a subterranean world, occupied by beings who seemed to resemble angels and call themselves Vrilia. The concept of Vril was given new impetus by the French author, Louis Jacolliot 1837-1890, who at one time was the French consul in Calcutta. In Les Fils de Dieu, 1873, and in Les Traditions Indrapines, 1876, Jacolliot claims that he encountered Vril among the Jains in Mysore and Gujarat. The writings of these two authors and Bulwer Lytton's occult background convinced some commentators that the fictionalized Vril was based on a real magical force. Helena Blavatsky, the founder of Theosophy, endorsed this view in her book, entitled Isis Unveiled, 1877, and again in The Secret Doctrine, 1888. These real aspects relate to the rise of Nazism in Germany during the 1930s and to some of the more unusual tales pertaining to World War II. A number of sources claim that a secret real society existed in pre-Nazi Berlin with connections to the Thule Society. The Thule Society was known as the organization that sponsored the Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, or DAP. The latter was later reorganized by Adolf Hitler into the National Socialist German Workers' Party, NSDAP, or Nazi Party. It is believed that many party members were Thule members or associates. There are theories that Hitler and his cohorts attempted to employ some form of real based technology to create flying disc and other elaborate technology. In some way, this notion also manifested stories of post-World War II Nazi bases in Antarctica and even on the moon. 
Strangely, Edgar Rice Burroughs satirized the Nazis by placing a fascist political faction called Xanus on the planet Venus in Carson of Venus, published in serialized form in 1938. In 1947, Robert A. Heinlein published a novel entitled Rocket Ship Galileo, which featured Nazis colonizing the moon after escape from their defeat on Earth. The story also features an ancient lunar civilization. Heinlein was one of three co-scripters of the 1950 movie entitled Destination Moon, loosely based on rocket ship Galileo. The Nazis on the moon plot device can still be seen today in the form of the 2012 movie Iron Sky. Whether as a form of subtle discourse or mere zeitgeist, these stories have continually permeated popular fiction. Steven Spielberg, in his original Indiana Jones film series, cemented much of the contemporary cultural notion that the Nazis were obsessed with the occult and advanced technology. On many levels the notion was actually true. The purpose of the Onanerb organization was to research the archaeological and cultural history of the hypothesized Aryan race. They were obsessed with locating objects believed to have extraordinary power, such as the Holy Grail, and extensively studied occult rituals and practices. The Nazi party itself was effectively a cult, the biggest giveaways being the double lightning strike logo of the SS and the use of the swastika, a powerful mystical and occult symbol in its own right. One of the most fondly remembered science fiction television shows to embrace the ancient alien concept was ABC's film series, Battlestar Galactica, 1978-1979. Originally entitled Adam's Ark, Battlestar Galactica, told the story of 12 colonies of man, a 13th long-lost tribe, left and settled on the planet Earth, and eventually established the human race. The colonies suffer an attack by the Cylons, robots created by an ancient reptilian race. Protected by the Battlestar Galactica, the survivors flee the colonies in search of Earth. The opening credits featured a narration that set the tone of the show. There are those who believe that life here began out there, far across the universe, with tribes of humans, who may have been the forefathers of the Egyptians, or the Toltecs, or the Mayans, that they may have been the architects of the Great Pyramids, or the lost civilizations of Lemuria or Atlantis. Some believe that there may yet be brothers of man, who even now fight to survive, somewhere beyond the heavens. In the documentary entitled, Remembering Battlestar Galactica, Glenn A. Larson, credited as creator or producer of the series, recalled his perspective of the show's origins. He said. I guess I was influenced by a number of things growing up. I have Mormon origins, but was always fascinated by the theory of things, for example, Greek mythology and the pyramids. I loved von Daniken's book, Chariots of the Gods. It's as if there was a greater source of knowledge. And whether it was Antarctica, back down where it belonged as Atlantis, or something else, it's reasonable to believe that a planet billions of years old may have floated a civilization or two that was very very advanced. I once thought to myself, what if heaven is the name of a planet? What if that's where our greater god is that built us, such as we are? Larson often indicated that the ancient alien paradigm influenced the show's roots. It also appears that Mormon beliefs played a crucial part. One telling example is the naming of the planet of the gods and birthplace of humanity, Kobol, in the show. Kobol is an analogous anagram of Kalab, a revered star or planet described in Mormon scripture. The show's religious propagation via the extraterrestrial subject was not exclusive to Battlestar Galactica. In 1980, the notorious movie, Hangar 18, was released. The film incorporated specific aspects of the extraterrestrial or UFO cover-up and, despite being a relatively low-budget production, received support from NASA and Rockwell International. Parts of the film were shot at Pyatt Air Force Base. The film was also one of a select few US films allowed to be shown in the former Soviet Union. Also in 1980, a television series hosted by Leonard Nimoy, entitled In Search Of, featured an episode about UFO cover-ups and examined charges that the US Air Force was hiding alien corpses and the remains of crashed spacecraft in Hangar 18 at Wright-Patterson AFB in Ohio. Hangar 18 was produced by Sun Classic Pictures, Sun Worship Maybe. Established in Utah as a Mormon-run company who employed many Mormon writers, producers and directors. According to researcher Robbie Graham, Sun Classic Pictures was established as an ideological tool for the purpose of influencing public opinion on subjects of great significance to the CIA, the military-industrial complex and the Knights of Malta, that is, UFOs and Christianity. The film's depiction of human-looking extraterrestrials is particularly interesting, as is the idea that these beings jump-started the human race. With this in mind, I find it curious that the themes of Battlestar Galactica seem to match what Robbie Graham discusses in relation to Hangar 18. This recently prompted me to revisit Galactica 1980, the short-lived Battlestar Galactica spin-off. 
After finally reaching Earth, several episodes involved the Galacticans playing cat and mouse with the USAF, using stealth technology to cloak their crafts. These episodes included an on-screen caption, just before the end credits, which read. The United States Air Force stopped investigating UFOs in 1969. After 22 years, they found no evidence of extraterrestrial visits and no threat to national security. For reasons still unknown to this day, ABC maintained that. They required a disclaimer to be shown on screen at the end of all episodes featuring the detachment. ABC equals Disney and Disney have most certainly involved themselves in perception management of the extraterrestrial and UFO paradigm. I will look at this subject in the next video. The pilot episode of Galactica 1980 also depicted a rogue Galactican scientist who travels back in time to World War II Germany to give highly advanced scientific knowledge to the Nazis. This plot doesn't sound too far removed from stories told by some proponents of theosophy and the like. Before anybody begins to ruminate about the possible connections between Glenn A. Larson and the Global Agenda players, it is vital that his claims that he created Battlestar Galactica be re-examined. It has long been alleged that Larson had a penchant for taking the credit for other writers' work. The legendary science fiction writer, Harlan Ellison, once famously referred to Larson as Glenn A. Larsony. Although not acknowledged by those who have officially documented the genesis and production of the show, a story has circulated amongst the Galactica fan community for many years that has truly divided their ranks. That the true creator of Battlestar Galactica was none other than Leslie Stevens, creator and executive producer, as well as writer-director of several episodes of the legendary sci-fi anthology series, The Outer Limits. In 2011, Andrew Fullin reposted a web article entitled, Leslie Stevens is the creator of Battlestar Galactica, by Susan J. Paxton. Enter director Alan J. Levi. Levi is known as the director of Gun on Ice Planet Zero, but he also directed half of the premiere after Richard Kala was let go by Larson. Levi was a good friend of the late Leslie Stevens. Recently I interviewed Alan Levi. I had not planned to ask him any questions about the origins of Battlestar Galactica because he had not been involved early enough in the process to know about it. But, out of the blue, with no prompting from me whatsoever, he said, well, Leslie Stevens wrote the original script. Leslie was one of my best friends. I do know that Leslie had told me at one time way before he ever got into the script that he had this great idea for a script that he was going to take to Glenn Larson and talk about. Suffice to say, Stevens had extensive military-industrial complex connections and esoteric views. In light of this revelation, and Robbie Graham's assertion that certain depictions of the ancient extraterrestrial intervention paradigm are ideological tools for the likes of the CIA and the military-industrial complex, the true nature of Battlestar Galactica really needs to be re-examined in a different light. Ronald D. Moore's remake of Battlestar Galactica series in 2003-2009 further contributed to the ancient extraterrestrial intervention paradigm. This series posited several thousand extraterrestrial humanoids and biological Cylons settling on Earth hundreds of thousands of years in the past and breeding with the natives. This combination of transhumanism and the ancient extraterrestrial intervention paradigm is now prevalent in contemporary sci-fi.